<laughs> Hello, English 1B students. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm in a little under the weather um, right now, but I wanted to say a few things about great short poems. Okay. Um, we're going to write an essay on some of the poems in this book, and you are going to choose the poems from this book that you write on. Um, I have a certain number I'm looking for, and I'm looking for the way in which you can weave them together. So the idea will not be to, you know, like three mini essays or something like that, but that you are going to pick poems that fit together. Okay. Now, the best way to prepare for this is to read this the way you read this. Okay. Action narrative straight through. We're still going to talk about this. Right now I'm promoting this because I think you could go back and forth with the poems. Uh, I'm not looking for you to spend a lot of time analyzing every single poem. In fact, I recommend that you try, and if it's not making enough sense to you, you skip to the next one. You come back later, okay? You try to get the sense of the, the things I keep emphasizing in our class. Situation, a character, a voice. What is, the, what is the, you know, sort of character saying to us? What are we getting? Are we getting something about the heart? Are we getting something about nature? Are we getting something about how death looms for us all? Are we getting something meant to be humorous? Okay. Um, so I actually recommend, and I'm going to write this up, that you just read through. And you put little marks, you know, whether it's sticky or you write on it, ones that actually seem to speak to you, that actually um, maybe speak to your personal experience. For our final exam, I'm going to have 12 to 15 of these listed, along with Cyrano and Dashiell Hammett, and I'll give you more on that. Um, but the idea is, again, we're practicing. So I believe, if I counted correctly, that there's something like 138, 140 different poems. They're all very, very short. We read them and we move on. Okay, that sort of thing. I am going, I, I've done some of these with you. I put a couple on video, um, right? Jenny, the kiss poems, the, the death poems, that sort of thing. And let me give you a quick another reading of a poem and again i look for the situation i look for the tone i try to figure out what how it makes sense okay okay um, is that... all right um on page eight matthew Pryor, who was a diplomat in the uh, 18th century he also wrote humorous poems and he wrote sweet poems but his humorous poems are actually um more successful in my mind we don't get any of that notice we really don't get anything about these authors if you're kind of interested that you might you know these might lead you to other poems and other other things um byron's in here for example um and we, you know, short poems are in here okay but matthew Pryor at the top of page page eight has a poem called a reasonable affliction and now I don't know what that title means until I read the poem. It's a lot like reading this. I get characters, but I don't know what I should think about them. Let me put that back on. I don't know what I should think about them. I don't know what what I don't know what matters. I have to read and then I have to think back, right? Okay, but we get signals. Come on. You know, Sam sweating at a certain point when he comes out after acting like so cool. The sweat is there to signal He's not as cool as he likes to pretend to be, okay? So he's an actor. We get that emphasized a number of different times. And, and you know, if you think about it, that's good for his job as, you know, private detective. But it also tells you something about the man. You can't just trust the surface. And the narration in this is surface, okay? And relationships matter. Now... If I'm going to read this little poem by Matthew Pryor, A Reasonable Affliction on page 8, I'm going to read and reread, right? It's only 8. Now, you know, I'm not doing this with every single poem. I'm doing with the ones that I actually want to figure out. We're going to get characters. We have this narrator who's outside, you know, sort of like an outside narrator, sort of like the 
outside narrator of this. We have um, Lubin, who's on his deathbed. Poor Lubin. We have his wife, and they're both crying and both sighing. And then we have Parson Sly. A parson is a priest. You might have to look some things up when you read these older poems. He's a priest. But his name's Sly. Sly means tricky, right? Okay, here we go. A reasonable affliction. On his deathbed, poor Lubin lies. His spouse is in despair. With frequent cries and mutual sighs, they both express their care. A different cause, says Parson Sly, the same effect may give. Poor Lubin fears that he may die, his wife that he may live. This might seem like a cold-blooded poem, because you have the religious figure who's commenting on how the poor man is crying and sighing because he fears he'll die. But his wife is looking forward to his death, and she fears he'll live. Okay. Notice how we have, and, and we get it almost a mathematical or a scientific maxim here, right? A different cause, the same effect may give. They're both crying, but they have different causes. One fears death, the other fears his living. Okay? The cleverness to me comes from setting up this situation in which we observe, you know, both crying, both sighing. And then we find out that you know they have different reasons and i think we're supposed to think of like wow what a i mean we don't know anything about the situation we don't know if the wife you know wants him to die because he's a wife beater we don't get that we get poor lubin a little bit of sympathy is she a gold digger you know we don't get any of that other than the idea that here's a situation in which it looks okay from the outside but if you know them individually it's different, and the wife has got motivations that are not exactly Christian, okay? She wants her husband. She fears he'll live. She wants him to die. And that's it. That's all we get. But it's only eight lines in a, and, and a title, a reasonable affliction. It's reasonable for him to cry and sigh because he fears death. He's sick. It's reasonable for her to cry and sigh because... She also fears something. So this is not a very, this is not like, um, this is like societal observation. Okay. Societal observation. Okay. Now I can't remember if we actually did the Robert Burns poem on page 11. We might have done it at the very beginning of the semester because I wanted to model the way in which poems work. This is called A Red, Red Rose. And I might have used this. I can't remember right now. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with revisiting. Um, we have a speaker. And basically he's saying, you're gorgeous. I love you a lot. I'm going to love you to the end of time. I'm going to love you beyond that. And, you know, if I were a thousand miles away, I would come see you. But I got to go. Okay, and so there's a twist ending at the end. You might remember if we did talk about this. You know, so I'm on page 11. A red, red rose. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonnie lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, to all the seas gang dry. To all the seas that gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee well, my only love, and fare thee well a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. I always wonder if this is a sailor or a soldier or sort of a traveling salesman, because he's like, I love you so much, but I gotta go. And to me, it seems this is a poem in which he wants her to wait or at least he wants her to welcome him back when he returns. He wants to leave on good circumstances. Just like the uh, Reasonable Affliction poem, we don't get a big backstory. We don't get any backstory, really. We're observing here, and there's like a nugget of humanity for us to relate to. Okay. Now, in this Red, Red Rose poem, 
We get a classic flower as a compliment. My love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. It's Scotland. Robert Burns is a famous Scottish poet. And spring comes late. Okay, but it's a spring flower. This is an old poem. You can see he's from the 18th century. Love's like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. She's like music, sweet music, in tune music. Now, you might think this is a tired, both of these are rather tired comparisons. Well, it's the 18th century, you know? Um, flower is spring. She's a spring flower. She's a wildflower, right? It's not a garden necessarily. Could be. I don't know. Anyway, the next part, though. Remember, 18th century, 1790, whatever. If you want music, someone's got to play, okay? Which means if you know have any any musicians in your family or even you yourself, it's not always in tune. So that would, time traveling, that would actually have, the compliment would have a little bit more power than the now maybe. But I can, I can time travel, I can imagine. All right. As fair art thou, as beautiful, as lovely as you are, that's what that means. My bonny lass, bonny is Scottish, lass is young girl, my lovely young girl, my sweet young girl. So deep in love and light, as much as you are pretty, that's how much I love you. That's how deep in love I am. Okay. And come on, the speaker might say, well, I'm really lovely. He must really love me. Okay. And I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gang dry. Gang means go. Okay. That's what it meant back then for like 300 years. Um, so he's going to love her. Till the end of time, right? Because when are the seas going to go dry? Till, till the end of time. And notice, it's like, ooh, that was a good one. I'm going to pick up and repeat that one. Till all the seas go dry, my dear. So, um, and the rocks melt with the sun. Was that the end of time? Right? <laughs> when the world is, is destroyed? I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. Um, I think the sands of life are meant to have us to think of a hourglass in which you measure time. They did that in the 18th century. They had watches, but they also had um, sand glasses, hourglasses um, that you could use to measure the time. And so first it's like, I'll end you. I'll love you forever. I'll love you to the end of time. I'll love you till I die. So part of my point here is there's actually variety even though you might seem, well, they're all just exaggerated claims. There's variety. See how much fun I'm having looking at this little short poem? Okay. And like, I'll love you till I die, but I got to go. Fare thee well. Bye-bye. Farewell. My only love. And fare thee well a while. And I will come again, my love, though it were 10,000 long. He's making a promise. And that's what we end with. We only have one side of this uh, exchange. We have his. I wonder what her poem would look like. Would it be, oh, he's such a sweet-toned lad. Is it, oh, man, he, he's so full of it. You know, again, part of the fun for me would be imagining the other poems. And that's part of what poetry would be for. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I did a general intro to how to read this, um, probably what we're going to do with it, and then two poems I walked you through. Okay. I hope you're all doing well. I'm a little, I'm a little ill, as I said, uh, but not, not the virus. Um, and I'll see you remotely again soon. Okay.